in the 1960s is, is when we started noticing leafy spurge coming in. It came in from the, the McClay place on the north. They had bought some hay, I believe, during the 30s uh, that came out of North Dakota because it, was, it had a, just a terrible uh, winters here and it was just it was so dry no one had any hay so they purchased hay from out of the country and brought in leafy spurge and it's um, it spread slowly at first and in the 60s we started no noticing little patches um, I don't think anyone was really concerned about it much until the 70s then it was really spreading it, it um, got acclimated to this climate and took off. And uh, we've been fighting it since the 70s, mostly spraying it. And um, the success of that has been dismal. It's a very difficult weed to control. We sprayed with 2,4-D um, Tordon, which is Picloram, Banvel, um, combinations of all different kinds, but uh, basically Tordon would be the, the chemical we use the most. It isn't very effective. Um, the other weeds that, the other major weed that, that was on the place was spotted knapweed. Spotted knapweed came in here in the 70s when we noticed as, as a, a, a weed that was really gaining uh, and, and taking up ground. Um, by the late 70s, early 80s, the entire ranch was, had uh, basically had some knapweed on it. In the uh, middle to late 80s, we sprayed the entire ranch, um, all 4,000 acres of it, um, out of, with a helicopter. And uh, that did a nice job of cleaning up the uh, knapweed. But it uh, reinfested again, and in another seven, eight years, it was right back just as sick as it always was. Um, we've been spraying for knapweed ever since. Um, every few years, you just got to just keep after it. Uh, fortunately, now they've got um, some insects that eat work on it, and I think um, it's the insects are going to control knapweed so that you'll have only have small infestations, but you won't have um, widespread uh, monocultures of it like we used to. Uh, yes, we've um, released um, insects all over all over the um, uh, ranch since the late '70s. Um, the first insects that came out were for leafy spurge. Um, we released uh, the hawk moth, which uh, has a big uh, caterpillar that uh, eats on it. That didn't work. I mean, it, it just eats the leaves. It doesn't hurt the plant very much. Then we um, released the flea beetles. They came right after that. Uh, the first ones they tried weren't effective, they didn't like this weather. Uh, they worked good in other parts of the country, they didn't work here. And uh, over the next few years, they got ones that work better in this climate. And we released uh, four different varieties. And uh, multiple years, multiple thousands of, of them. Uh, where they've established, we've uh, netted them and moved them around. So they're basically all over the entire ranch now. Um, they work in some areas, they thin out the leafy spurge, they stress the spurge. Uh, are they effective? I think minimally. I, I think they have to be used in conjunction with something else to be most effective. Some kind of chemical, some kind of uh, cultural practices too, maybe grazing with uh, sheep or goats, some chemical application, um, more varieties of insects. Um, I think it's going to take basically a, a very integrated um, management to control leafy spurge. It's very 
very tough weed. Cheatgrass is, is becoming a, a major pest. A lot of, I believe a lot of uh, the cheatgrass has moved into this country because of our spraying. Uh, I think uh, the chemicals we've used to get rid of knapweed and leafy spurge have uh, taken out grass species and taken out forbs and other uh, broadleaf plants, opened up uh, canopy enough so that cheatgrass could get a hold. And I think um, that in the long run, we weren't served well by spraying. Uh, the way we managed it was to graze it. Uh, if you can graze it uh, hard, early before it sets seed, uh, it's an annual, so if you can keep it from setting seed, you pretty well have it. Uh, you can reduce it a lot. Our trouble was that we were raising cattle and it's hard to con confine them uh, enough to so that they'll only eat just the cheap grass and not overgraze their other grasses that you have. So it was, it was difficult uh, to control. Yeah, the patterns of the, of the weeds, it, it's kind of interesting where, how they moved. They started in the river bottom and uh, where there was more moisture and that was the places they got in, uh, started and they were, that's where they were the thickest. And I think a lot of that probably was is because uh, a lot of cattle like to lay down where it's uh, cooler and shaded and those uh, areas of the ranch probably got grazed harder than other places. That left an opening for the weeds. Uh, we, the river bottom got infested and then they started going up the gullies and, and ravines in the ranch. And I was carried by wild animals and probably livestock also. But uh, you could see the weeds went right up the game trails. And you can still notice that today uh, that the weeds uh, especially leafy spurge follows along where um, wildlife goes. Uh, yeah, the areas that are, um, uh, have the best luck keeping the weeds out are where the range is in the best condition. And uh, those on this ranch are almost always on north slopes, north facing slopes that get at higher elevations that get the, uh, a little more moisture and a little more shade. The weeds that do the best here grow more on the droughty west and southwest facing slopes. Unfortunately, this ranch has a lot of those and not very many north facing slopes. But uh, on the north facing slopes, we have good stands of Idaho fescue, rough fescue, blue bunch wheatgrass, and a variety of forbs. And the weeds basically just stay out of those areas for the most part.